uh, part of scripture. And kind of, uh, just if you're able to see the picture on the screen, when we were last in the Old Testament, we were, we did Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We did the first five books of the Old Testament. And then we jumped up and did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So now we're going back. And so just to put our minds back to where we were, the last time we were in um, the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, God, God um, says to Moses, he says, I'm going to let you see the land of promise. You're not allowed to enter into it because of, because Moses had rebelled himself. This was a consequence of his sin. God said, you can't enter it, but I'm, I'm going to let you see it. And so God gave Moses uh, uh, this, this overlook, brought him up to a mountain, and, and Moses is able to look over the land that God had promised to their forefathers 400 years before. God had called Abram out of the land of Haran. He left by faith, journeyed to the promised land, called the land of Canaan at that time. And God said to Abram, he said, one day, all of this land I'm get, will belong to you and your descendants. In the meantime, the sin of the Amorites is not yet full, and so you're going to have to wait. And so then ultimately we see this journey down into Egypt, uh, and then we see the journey out of Egypt after the Israelites had spent many, many years as slaves and being oppressed. Uh, they could have taken the land, but it was only a two-week journey, but because they rebelled, they spent 40 years in the wilderness, and an entire generation who said, hey, listen, our children are going to be devoured by these people. We're just too weak and we can't do it. And God said, You're the, the ones you think are too weak are the ones who are going to inherit it. Uh, and there was only two people that survived um, those 40 years. One of them, Moses' assistant, Joshua. Twelve spies had been sent into the land. Ten of them ret returned with a bad report. Joshua and Caleb came back and said, we're, we're, it's right for the taking. Um, it belongs to us. God's going to give it to us. Let's go. But they got outvoted. And so after all those 40 years, there's two survivors. One is Joshua, who has just become the leader of the people. He was Moses' assistant for 40 years. And God says, uh, the baton has passed from Moses to Joshua. And Joshua is the new leader. And to Joshua, who might have been timid, I don't know, but maybe, maybe not, numerous times in chapter 1, Joshua receives the same message from the Lord. Be strong and courageous. Uh, it was a big job before him. There was a lot of obstacles before him. Uh, one of those obstacles was the River Jordan. They're on one side of the Jordan, the Promised Land is on the other. So there's, that's obstacle number one. Um, another obstacle in front of them, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit this morning, is the city of Jericho, a fortified city, well-stocked, well-armed, um, right at the beachhead of the Promised Land. And so how are things going to go as they cross over when they encounter their first resistance uh, to them receiving God's promise? Uh, and, and the other obstacle, and this is sometimes an obstacle that uh, when we think about you know, when, when it comes to following God, there's always going to be obstacles, isn't there? Obstacles are always in front of us. Uh, in this case, when we enumerate them, there's a river, got to get across somehow. There's a, there's a fortified city that stands in the way. And then there's the, the, the third, and there's the forgotten obstacle, is the attitude and the heart of people themselves. Uh, you know, at one point, the Israelites said, we can't do it, and we're not going, no matter what God says. <coughs> At this point, they're ready and willing in their hearts, but it's not always the case, isn't it? And so when we think about following God and being strong and courageous, because that call is for each one of us in our service of God, stand up for Christ. Identify yourself as his follower. Live for him in a world that is, that is, that is spiritually dark. You are the light. You are the salt. Be strong and courageous. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes we're ready and willing, and sometimes... We've, we see all the obstacles, uh, and we start to wilt a little bit. And so that's the third obstacle that's there. The other neat thing about, just before, and I don't want to forget this, is Joshua's name, good reminder. Uh, sometimes people are very intentional about the way that the names they give. Joshua's name literally means Yahweh saves. Yahweh is God's personal name. So when you read in the Old Testament, and it's capital L, capital O, R, D, that's God's personal name. And so Joshua, when transliterated, it, it, and we, we, we spell it out, it means the Lord saves. And so 
know, here he's charged to be strong and courageous, and here he's also reminded every time someone calls his name, that it's not his wisdom that's going to get them to the promised land. It's not his strength that's going to get them there. It's not his money. It's not the, it's not the number of people that, that are with him that, it, that is the key to, to, to victory and success. It's, it all rests upon who's with him, and it all rests upon the Lord being with him. And so, uh, wonderful, wonderful name, wonderful meaning. And so, there's the optional. Um, and as we go, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, one of the things that this, uh, I know it's hard to see because of the light there. Um, you see a woman in the doorway uh, pointing some, some soldiers away. Uh, and in Joshua chapter 2, um, there's, there's uh, two Israelite spies who have taken <laughs> refuge in the house of a prostitute, which is interesting. Um, they were sent to spy out the land. They end up in, the, in, and we'll talk about this, they end up in the house of a prostitute, which on the surface sounds a little bit odd. Um, but one of the things that comes out of this account of the spying out of the land is, it made me think about it, is um, unlikely sources of help in time of need. The, the, the Rahab coming to the assistance of these Israelite spies um, is kind of unforeseen. And, and, and when I think about that application, and it's by no means the biggest point of the text, but it is a point of the text, is when you think about sometimes the way God helps us or who he sends to help us, it's, it's not always who you think is going to be the person. Um, you know, I... I and, and, and the challenge is, think of the person or group who, who you would think would be least likely to help you in your time of need. And God flips that around sometimes, doesn't he? The person that we may look at and judge because of what they're wearing or what they're doing or their, whatever they're into, uh, it just could be that that's the person that God's going to have help you that day um, in your time of need. And that, well, that's the one of the neat little points that just flips out of the passage that we're going to read in a moment is, and if I'm thinking, who's going to help me, I'm not thinking a prostitute is going to be helping me today. <laughs> yep, that's exactly what God does in the text. Um, uh, and, and this lady goes on to be pretty famous in the end. Uh, but it, it's an interesting point that comes out of the passage. So let's have a look at the passage itself, and then we're going to dig into some of the lessons of it. It says in Joshua chapter 2, and so that they, they're ready to enter into the land, and there's the first obstacle, a river, there's a city, and then of course their attitudes, but their attitudes are right at this point. And it says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim and his spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and they lodged there. And it was told of the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, Yes, it's true. The men came to me, but I didn't know where they came from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I don't know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them within, with the stalks of flax that she had laid out in order on the roof. And so the soldiers, the men, they pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fjords. And the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof, and she said to them, I know that the Lord, and it's kind of interesting, she knows the personal name of God, because it's capital L-O-R-D, I know that Yahweh has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt with you kindly, that you will also deal kindly with my father's house, 
and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brother and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our lives for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned, and then afterward you may go your way. The men said to her, We will be guiltless with respect to this oath of ours that you made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord. So the, we learn the rope is a red, red, red rope. You shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you've let us down, and you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your father's households. And then if anyone goes out of the door of your house into the street, then their blood will be on their own head, and we will be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. And if you tell of this business of ours, then we shall be basically released. We will be guiltless with respect to you this oath that you have made us swear. And she said, According to your words, so be it. And so she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned, and the pursuers searched all along the road, and they found nothing. And the two men returned, they came down from the hills, and they passed over, and they came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they told him all that had happened. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. So there's a few things I want to draw to your attention. And the first thing is, just a couple notes for the next slide. Uh, thanks, Lola. Is here is an actual picture of what's it's called a tell, so it's a mound of earth. Here's an actual picture of the city, the remains of the city of Jericho. So on your left, you see this mound um, that's got several excavation points uh, littered throughout it because in the last uh, 150 years, archaeological teams have been going there and digging down certain sections and, and so they, they can find out what this particular city was like. Jer Jericho has been at the center of controversy for a long time. For a long time, people said, well, prove to us that Jericho exists. And then they find Jericho and they're like, well, now, now we'll, be, well we found the city, but uh, can you actually prove the account of the scriptures? Uh, and so haters are going to hate, and they keep on. Uh, here is on the right side of that is actually a picture going back to 1908. Some of the excavations straight down through all the debris, right down to the city, part of the city streets that would have existed in that time. Another picture on the next slide, go ahead, uh, is there is uh, actually three neat things. One, you see some pottery jars. One of the things that tells us that the, I mentioned that Jericho is a fortified city and they were well stocked and the evidence that they had, were well stocked, we talked about the spring um, and so the people, the inhabitants would have taken refuge, the coming of the Israelites, it says they were very scared and so they all barricaded themselves into the city. Uh, and these are actual grain pots that are found filled with charred grain. So it's, it was, we're told in the text that when the Israelites conquered the city that after the walls fell down, uh, that they, they, the inhabitants uh, they, they were killed and then they set the city on fire. And so there's evidence there that this is a city of Jericho. The walls fell down, which we'll read in Joshua 6 to 10 this week. The walls fell down outwards, just as uh, was said, and the city was set on fire. And so there's all archaeological evidence showing, indeed, that all these things happened. So these inside of these jars are is the charred remains of well-stocked grain reserves. Uh, the top top right is a is a, a graphic depiction of. Uh, what how the falling of the walls would have looked like. And the bottom picture is a computer rendered depiction of how the outside of that mound that was formerly Jericho would have looked. It was a double wall system. And Rahab lived in the low rent district of the city uh, on, this, uh, on the outside wall. And so if you're on the inside wall, it's safer and more secure. And, and if you had more money, that's where you live. But there would have been so it says that she lived in the wall, 
They actually, in the archaeological <coughs> excavations, they did find uh, rooms backing up right to that outside wall. And then there is this high, they discovered as well, there's like, you see a little tiny people on the bottom, right? It, it was quite a drop, 25 feet or so. And so, um, then, and then there was a window, so she really did live in the wall uh, and, and had, a, had a spot on top. Uh, and so, and when, and then you can see the picture of how the walls would have fallen. In fact, uh, archaeological uh, records indicate that the, that the walls indeed did fall down outward, which then gave a nice, ramp for, people, for the invading Israelites to follow up into the city. They also found, really kind of fascinating, um, uh, evidence, this dates back to 1907, 1909, an excavation, they found a short stretch of the lower wall that did not fall as all the rest of the walls did. So when they did this, they actually found a short stretch of the wall that was still standing and hadn't fallen. Um, and they found that there was houses backing up against the wall. And so, despite what uh, people like, uh, there's an archaeologist who disputed the biblical account named Kathleen Kenyon, but basically she rewrote it. She wasn't, she had no interest in God or even in the Bible, but all the things that she found, if you look at it from another, from the, another perspective, all the stuff she finds actually confirms everything that's said in the scriptures. She just had an anti-bias against the church and against God. Um, but it's quite fascinating, real city. And oh, the other thing is, I always in my mind, whenever I thought of Jericho, I thought this massive city, because I looked at fortresses, and there's some amazing walled cities in the world to this day, with walls that date back into the 1200s and even back to the 300s, and they're huge. So I always envisioned Jericho as this monster of some sort. Uh, but it wasn't. And that, go back one slide, uh, is this, uh, that mound of earth is about, there's about nine, nine total acres and so uh, that, and that includes the wall system so livable space was about uh, six acres and in terms of population density on average they would have a hundred people per acre so uh, the usual population of the city would have been about 600 uh, but with the threat of war people from out the outside would have clamored into the city so probably a population of two to three thousand people um, at that particular time, but well armed and well fortified and under normal circumstances would have been able to hold out against the siege for a number of years. Uh, and uh, so that's just a little fun filled background on the city of Jericho, uh, the first obstacle in their way. But the point is, is when you read your Bible, you can trust your Bible. Real people, real places, real events. It's the word of God, so don't read like, oh, I don't know if this has ever true or ever happened. No, it really did happen. It's real people, real places, real events. Um, uh, now, that, now that we're on the next uh, slide, please, thank you, is, you know, there is some tension in our text. Um, the tension um, is, in, I love this picture. I found this picture last night. I found it very interesting. Which one's the devil? And it's the little girl. <laughs> right, you see the shadow in the back? <laughs> Uh, appearances are deceiving. Um, sometimes you'll hear someone say, I've got a good explanation. And you're like, you better have a good explanation. <laughs> right? You've heard that, right? Someone gets caught in what looks to be a very compromising situation, um, ethically, morally, financially, and you're like, oh, wait a second, I have a good explanation for this. And that's kind of what's going on in the passage. Uh, the, in, in verse 1, what does it say? It says, Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies. What does he say? He says, go view the land, especially Jericho. And what does it say in the very next half of the sentence? It says, and they went and went into the house of a prostitute. And you're like, what? <laughs> like, how does that factor into their whole spying thing? And, and it's one of these cases where there's actually a good explanation. Um, it's, you know, some people would be like, oh, well, they are out on this field trip and they just decide to go have some fun. Um, that's not the case. Um, and the reason that's not the case, it went, and for those that would think, oh, they, they were, they're caught in sin somehow. The last time the Israelites had uh, uh, the Amorites sent a whole bunch of people to sexually avail themselves to, things went very badly for the Israelites that time. 
Uh, they also had a, some commands that God had given that said prostitution is punishable by death. And so when we think about the Israelites, the two spies, and we read these little phrase, uh, go spy out the land, and in the very next half of the sentence, and now they're at the house of a prostitute, we're like, what is going on here? Uh, and so I, was, I would suggest to you there's actually nothing going on, um, but it looks bad. There's no doubt about it. It does look bad. And yet, appearances can be deceiving. And, and, and one of the reasons they would have, uh, her place would have been a good place to go to um, is because it was in the low-rent district of Jericho, off the beaten path. There would have been a lot of people coming and going through her house, so this particular house <coughs> having visitors wouldn't have raised any real alarm normally amongst people. And so there's actually a strategic reason for them going and seeking lodging in her place as part of their spying out of Jericho. So, and, and then, you know, like I said, when he taught that on the fact that um, these men are trusted sent specifically by Joshua, who's, by the way, one of the only two survivors of the last time there was a spy trip into the Promised Land. There's a lot resting on these two men to behave and do the right thing and, and act because the last time people went again, the whole nation suffered because of people's sin. And so while there's a little tinge of what's going on here, why does it say they ended up, there's actually, a, actually a, a good explanation for why they ended up there. And so the point is, things are not always as they appear, um, which is an interesting point in itself. Now, um, another, there is some other points for us. Is, uh, Rahab, let's talk about Rahab, let's go to the next slide. Rahab is a, in the end, she becomes a remarkable woman of faith. Um, now, the text does emphasize that at this particular point, she's, she's a prostitute. And so, she, she, in the end, she ends up as a hero of faith who's actually listed in Hebrews 11, the great chapter of faith in the Bible. And yet, she makes quite a journey in her life from, from the town <clears throat> prostitute to being in a chapter reserved for the heroes of the faith of the, in, the, in the Bible. And which is, which is kind of neat when you think about it. Um, and so, yes, she was a prostitute, but in the end, the focus is on who she became in the Lord. And I think you and I can pretty much connect that to our own lives. When we become a follower of Jesus, is the focus now on who were you before? Or is the focus on this is who you are now in Christ? The Bible says that when a person comes to Jesus, they become a new creature in Christ. Your sins are forgiven or washed away because of what Jesus did on the cross. He, Jesus took the punishment we deserve for our sins. And we become new creatures in Christ. And so, yes, there's a, it's clear this is what she was. But the scriptures uh, turn our focus and say, this is who she became, and she became, ultimately, in the end, she becomes a model of faith and righteousness in the end. But that's not how she started. And that's easy for you and I to connect to and realize in our own lives. Um, one of the, th let me, uh, three things I want, four things I want to point out. First off, this is one of the things that's notable about her. She recognized the Lord to be the one true God. She speaks about, she uses the personal name of God at least four times in the passage. And, and she's speaking of the Lord in, in, in respectful, honorific ways, but also she's speaking of the Lord in, in, in a sense of a personal faith-based way. And so she recognizes God to be the one true God, um, which is a great contrast. Remember when we were back in, in, in uh, Moses encountering Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh is like, who is the Lord that I should obey? Pharaoh learned the hard way who the Lord was and why he should obey him and let the people of Israel go. Uh, it's not a great thing to say, who is the Lord that I should obey him? But that's not Rahab. She says, I know, I've heard of the Lord. Um, the people around me are melting in fear because of him. But she's not melting in fear because of the Lord. She, there is, her heart has been drawn to the Lord in faith. And so she becomes, a, she recognizes God, the Lord to be the one true God. She personally puts her faith in God. Um, she's also a woman of courage who is 
You know, the Bible says, what, what was the charge to Joshua? Be strong and courageous. What is she? She's strong and courageous. People come to her door with the head swords uh, and are looking for the men. And she's like, hey, they're not here. And she's also done the extra step of hiding them under the, under the, uh, the, the bushels of wheat stuff in the, on, on the roof. She's a strong and courageous woman. She's also a woman who is uh, uh, concerned about her family. It's not just, she's not just trying to save her neck. She also says, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about my mom, my dad, my brothers, my sisters. Um, you know, I, I want to make a deal with you that it's not just me that you save, because she knows what's, she knows the end, she knows what's coming. The judgment of God is coming. And she says, it's not just me that I want to be saved, I want to see my family saved as well. Uh, that's, that's an incredible faith. She then goes on to scriptures, she's actually included in the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew chapter 1. She, 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 after the, the city is taken, she joins the Israelites. She's a, she becomes a follower of God. She marries a man named Salmon. 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 <laughs> um, I can't say pronounce that, right? <laughs> uh, and, and, and Salmon. And then Salmon and, and her have a guy named Boaz, who just so happens to bump into a lady named Ruth. <laughs> Uh, and then they have to have a, a, someone who becomes a descendant of King David. And so when you read in Matthew, so there's an example of how, God, how amazing God's grace is and what God is doing in the lives of people. Um, and so she's in Jesus' family tree. She's listed in Hebrews chapter 11 as a great woman of faith. And so that's backstory on Ruth. Now there is one thing, and we're almost done, is, um, go to the next slide. She's a remarkable woman of faith, but there is another important lesson for us. You and I, as we look in the passage, we are to copy Rahab's faith, we are to copy her courage, we are to copy her concern for her family, but we're not to copy her sins. There's two particular sins that, that, are, that are pointed at in the text. First one, obvious one, sorry, Prostitution, right? Does the text say prostitution's wrong right there? <coughs> not, not right there, at least. It just says she's a prostitute. There's no, nothing is said about that. It also says she's a liar, right? Like, hey, well, they're not here. They went that way. You know what that's called, right? That's called lying. Um, and so, copy her faith. Copy her courage, copy her concern for her family, don't copy her sins. How do I know that the prostitution is a sin? Because there's a whole chapter in the Bible about sexual behaviors that are forbidden. Prostitution happens to be one of those sexual practices that's forbidden. Uh, the other thing is there's lots of references throughout the scriptures that lying is a sin, and lying is always a sin, just like prostitution is a sin, and it's always a sin. And so sometimes people get sucked into the, this passage and they're like, you know, maybe it is okay to lie to save someone's life or lie to do this or lie to do that. Um, but I don't ever see them making the prostitution argument the same way. But they, <laughs> but they, go, with, but they go with lying. Um, and, and the, but the point is, is there's, when you and I read the Bible, don't read it like you just read only, that's the only passage you're ever going to read in your entire life. So if, you're, if, you, if maybe you've read the Bible for the first time today, and this is the only passage you've read, there's other chapters in the Bible that would say prostitution is not good, and, and lying is also a sin. And so copy her faith. But it does illustrate something about us, is, you know, we, uh, there's a certain... And this is the tension we face, right? We look, at, we look at Rahab, her whole life is on display, the good, the bad, the person that she became, the wonderful example of faith. Uh, and then we think about ourselves, we are, well, I, I like this little picture, kind of messes, aren't we? <laughs> like in one person, you can find a lot of divergence. Oh, yeah. And you see it in her. One hand, there's this budding faith, this budding commitment to God, but on the other hand, there's some pretty ugly stuff that's still going on. 
And when you and I get past the gleam of Sunday morning, because we all shine ourselves up to come to church, right? <laughs> you know, I don't hear a lot of swearing on Sunday. <laughs> uh, but it, I know what life is like, right? And, I, and, and, and so once you step into someone's world and you go walk in their house, um, and, and you're like, wait a minute, there's, there's a little, they're not exactly the same as I saw them in church. <laughs> Well, look at Rahab, right? Uh, she's a mess that's in process and who, in the end, commits herself wholeheartedly. I'm going to live a holy life and I'm going to live for God. And that stuff gets cleaned up along the way. And you and I, we, we, we come to Christ and the Bible says, here's who you were. Here's the sins that, that, you, that you were obviously dealing with. And at one point, you didn't even recognize they were sins. That's how blind you were. Uh, and yet God opens up our hearts and lives and brings us to faith and brings us to conviction, brings us to Christ. And we realize I'm worse than I thought I was and how amazing is God's grace. And then there's this call to, with God's help and the Holy Spirit, to say, you know what? I'm not staying there. I want to become a person who's, who's strong and courageous, who cares about the salvation of other people and who exercises faith and who pursues holiness. That's the next steps, isn't it? That's how she ends up in the, in the hall of faith uh, in Hebrews 11. But when you look at this point, she's still a mess. She's doing some really good stuff, and she's doing some bad stuff at the very same time. So when we look at this passage, don't use it like as a proof text to like, oh, it's okay to lie sometimes, it's okay to do this, and that, and that, and that, because I see it in this Bible passage. No, that's not the point. Uh, we see her at a snapshot of time where there's this burden of faith, but she's still a wreck. Uh, and yet that's not who, how she ended up. Uh, and so God, can, we can agree together, God's grace in our lives is incredible. And it all hinges upon Jesus, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and took the death that we deserve. And then that, well, that very last slide is, see a little picture, someone's artistic, they, they show she was supposed to leave this cord hanging, a red rope hanging at the window. Why? So that when the people of Israelites saw it, there's judgment day is coming. Judgment day is coming for Jericho. And they said, you hang that rope out and, and we will, you'll be passed over and you'll be spared. And we're reminded that, yes, judgment day is coming and there is a way to be spared. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Put your faith in Christ that you may have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And then what is God's promise? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's been taken away because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. Let's stand together. I, there's a song called Love Ran Red. Let's sing it as we close. <laughs>